This is Gail Morgan thanking you for watching the Libertarian Counterpoint each Thursday at 8 p.m. Channel 17 on Comcast, on YouTube, and on Facebook. Thank you for joining us today. With me is John Cameron, and we have a special guest, Mr. Robert Meyer. He is a political, economic, and financial analyst. And before we start today, we want to make sure we, we, we say that Please, we are not giving financial advice. Any individual financial advice needs to be gotten through your own personal financial advisor. Disclaimer right off the top seems to be going around these days. And for more information about Robert, please visit ramoneyjourney.com. <coughs> okay, gentlemen, we have had a, a interesting last week or so in the stock market. And we actually booked Robert about a month ago, so the timing of this is actually pretty convenient. We kind of seem to work out. Can you explain to us, Robert, about kind of what's going on with this whole GameStop theory and kind of the modern monetary theory is backing it? Because there's been lots of conversations about, you know, the Redditor side, the emotional side of it. There's been lots of conversations about the hedge fund side of it, but not many people have talked about the underpinnings, the monetary theory underpinnings. Okay, it starts with the Federal Reserve System and their uh, stimulus programs or bailouts and also their artificially low interest rates by like near zero percent. And that obviously penalizes the average person. Let's say you're on a fixed income or the fact that you want to put your money in a savings account. You don't want to speculate in the stock market. That kind of ends that. So the only way you're going to be able to make any money is possibly speculate in the stock market and most people aren't savvy enough to do that. But the way it applies to modern monetary theory is it didn't cause any real price inflation in the market because of the velocity of money's plummeted. And that's because people are in fear, especially during the pandemic. They are afraid to spend too much money. At least most people are. So these people that believe in modern monetary theory, they think the fact that all this money creation did not cause inflation although it caused the stock market bubble and other asset bubble they think that they can create as much money as possible and still control inflation which is a big fallacy because they're not looking at the psychological facts behind inflation of course the classical definition of inflation is increasing the quantity of money that's increasing the money supply most people look at price increases now as inflation so they've kind of made the effect the cause but modern monetary theorists, <clears throat> excuse me, they think that uh, they can create as much money as possible, spend it on whatever they want. They can pay off student loans. They can have all kinds of stimulus programs. They can have basic universal income. In fact, they can fund any kind of program they want. And if there happens to be inflation, they believe that, well, we can just raise taxes and siphon the money off the marketplace, which is a total fallacy because they don't understand the psychological effects of inflation. Once people believe that the depreciation of the currency is going to continue forever, they start getting rid of it as fast as possible. And then you have high inflation and possibly hyperinflation. And anyway, their tax schemes won't work because unless you're an idiot, you're going to try to protect your, protect your money by, you know, sending it overseas or investing in precious metals or, even doing something else with it, uh, the you know tax hedge, tax hedges are going to, of course, they'll try to get rid of those too. But I don't think they'll be able to. So the whole theory is basically flawed. Yeah, they, they act like people can't move. Like California's seen an exodus of of rich people, middle class, and the lower wealthy class moving because well, and, the, and poor, they can't too. afford it. And poor because the people that uh, move themselves are lower middle class or lower class. And all the numbers are showing that the U-Haul business is going crazy. But the what I'd love to see is uh, is the numbers on moving services. Like, because uh, if you're got any kind of means at all, you're not about to pack boxes and haul them on your back up a ramp into a U-Haul and drive somewhere. You're gonna pay somebody to do that. And we haven't seen numbers on that. And when we do, they're gonna be astounding. I got a question. I, I I typically, whenever a new theory of money comes up, um, I, my, my first thought, uh, Robert, is that, um, well, this is just a way for, for people who want to spend more money than, than they can 
um, to just like people get a new credit card and they get a mm -hmm. cash advance on the credit card to pay the bill for the last credit card they have. They're, they, it's it's really like a pyramid scheme, but they label it something new so that they can outspend uh, the the amount of revenue that's coming in. And and every time I took a look at it, uh, it sounded like total mumbo jumbo to me. And and they keep quoting authors from like 1905 is writing the seminal papers on it and i'm looking at it and and if i i'm going to try to rephrase what you said in my words and see if i'm if i'm close to the to the description they 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 believe that that you don't have the only reason you use taxes and you don't even need to sell bonds because you're just writing you're just basically printing the money and shipping it out there and you control the supply of money but if inflation does take off you simply tax the money back out of the system. Uh, but if inflation doesn't take off, you don't need to tax it. You're just printing money. Is that a very short, would you say that's a decent, very short description of modern monetary theory? Or did I miss something? Uh, that is correct. And also because of that, they believe deficits don't matter. Yeah. So if you have a 27 trillion deficit, it doesn't matter. You can take it to 39 trillion, 50 million yeah. trillion, 100 trillion. Mm -hmm. But the, the, the problem still is the psychology behind inflation because they just completely disregard the velocity of money. Normally, during, you know, if you had, you were under the gold standard and uh, you had, uh, you know, the only real inflation you had was if they increase the quantity of gold, you know, mine more gold. But even then, prices would gradually fall because production would outweigh that. You know, that would be the velocity of money would probably stay pretty much the same. It would just fluctuate some. But they don't understand that if they keep printing all this money, all they do is look at Venezuela or any other place where they've had or even Germany in the early 20s. All they have to do is look at the psychological aspects. People are once Zimbabwe. In, yeah. Yeah, Zimbabwe. That's a perfect example. All they have to do is look at history and look at human psychology to know that if your money is you suddenly realize it's losing purchasing power, you're gonna to want to get rid of it and get something of real value. And also wouldn't and and I, I think this is logical, but correct me if I'm wrong. If you've got uh, if you've got a credit card and it's got like I don't know, thirty, forty thousand dollar limit on it. And you know that um, you've got an income stream that somebody's going to keep ratcheting up to to match inflation. You'll go out and buy whatever you can because when you pay that credit card off, because you or I actually have to pay our debts, unlike right. unlike the government. When you go and pay it off, you might pay it off for cents on the dollar instead of paying, you know, a dollar back plus whatever interest rates are being charged on money you can borrow. You're paying back. 30 cents or 50 cents or 70 cents with whatever interest rates are being charged. So the, the, the aspect of inflation uh, pushes people to, to, if they can, leverage themselves with funny money even more, which adds to the inflation. Is that correct? That is correct, although it's kind of rather dangerous because there's a slight chance that we could uh, have a deflationary class before we have the hyperinflation. Mm -hmm. So yeah. it's kind of no, dangerous. I'm, I'm, uh, <laughs> yeah, I, uh, I, yeah, you know, we, we were taught, our generation, I'm, I'm yeah. assuming, not the youngin that's sitting over there to your <laughs> left on the screen. Yeah. Um, we were, we were taught what you do is you're, you're, you save a certain percent, you give a certain percent to charity and, you expect by, through your savings and being thrifty for it, you put it somewhere and it's going to generate a safe return on investment. And that safe return on investment was usually like one and a half percentage points of above whatever treasury bonds were paying. Right. You could get a CD or something. If you want to take a little more risk, you would put it in blue chip stocks or you'd buy real estate. And except in California where you've had huge inflation, in real estate prices and, and what, what this economy that we've, been that we've been in for the last 10 years is, is basically punished people for thrift. Uh, it's rewarded people for running up debt and punished people for not running up debt. And uh, yeah, I don't, yeah, every time I read it, uh, it, it strikes me as um, BS. How about if I just say BS? It is uh, BS. <laughs> and it's every time the, the, the yahoos in, in power want to, uh, 
want to want to do something, they just come up with a new theory to promote it. Uh, and I know it's your it's kind of your show today, but I always think that works. What a rule in physics, a rule works for this much of something or that much of something. I can't really do this on the screen properly because I'm not very coordinated, apparently. Um, <laughs> but apparently in monetary policy, the rule that applies to an individual, which is if you run up debt, you got to pay it off, right. <laughs> doesn't apply on the macro scale. And whenever anybody starts waving that flag around, I think, Oh, somebody's trying to do a shell game on me, and they're just justifying writing checks that don't have anything to cover it with. Yeah, yeah. that's here's right. An, yeah, here's another thing. Like you, we, you mentioned GameStop, for instance. I mean, mm -hmm. during a, if we didn't have the Fed pumping up the quantity of money like they were, and the money now, most of it goes into <clears throat> the stock market. You wouldn't have anything like GameStop. And then you have JP Morgan, you know, they were manipulating the price of silver and these head funds are short and trying to short these things like GameStop, which kind of makes sense since, you know, there's nothing behind them. But that gave these uh, millennials or young people a chance to pull some quick money out and get even with them. See and the now, key I made for you? Sorry. And, and, and now, they were talking about doing that on the silver markets that you have about a hundred paper contracts for every ounce of silver. I mean, it's totally ridiculous, but I think now that uh, JP Morgan's probably wise to what's up, although the silver price is up seven or 8% today, I believe. Yeah, yeah, it's but, around uh, it's kind of dangerous to keep trying that, although they, you know, they succeeded at uh, uh, doing the, sh uh, causing the short squeezes, you know, for a while, they're not going to get by with it long because, you know, it's like, like uh, George Carlin said, it's a big club and you ain't in it. And those millennials on uh, Reddit aren't in it. Yeah, I was I was thinking that because what's happened is is that the Fed stepped in, but they they didn't mm -hmm. step. The regulatory agencies didn't step in to help the little guy. No. They stepped in to help the big guy because the big guys are the ones that give the political donations to the party that supports having all the regulators. So it's uh, you know which you know who's going to win that fight. Well, I guess you have to define yeah. you have to define victory. Is victory yeah. just to cause pain to the hedge funds, and you know, then you don't really care if you lose money? Because for a lot of people, I've been talking to in the whole Reddit issue, people who are participating in it, they don't really care. They can't, went in with a thousand bucks, kind of like you're going to Vegas. You go in, you, you hit, put in twenty bucks into your into the slot machine. You win a hundred, and you just start playing with that hundred, and you don't really care what happens, how much you walk out with, as long as you still have that initial twenty bucks. Yeah, and so so they're just playing with their money at this stage, and so you know, victory for them is not actually walking away with a pocket full of money. That'd be nice if they, if it does, but victory for them is simply causing pain to the system, and the system doesn't seem to understand that. Yeah, well, and I think you know when you talk, people talk about hedge funds as if they're evil, and you know all hedge fund managers are basically as people who manage mutual funds that normal people can't buy. You can't buy them on the market. It's a, it's a, it's a, it is a private club, but they're simply managing people's money, and and a lot of them are super wealthy. But no, it's the behavior yeah, I, I mean, think of it's, the problem. It's, you know, it's it's uh, if if I'm a, if I've done well enough to qualify to you know buy something from a head for put my money with a head fund manager, then um, you know I should be applauded not not denigrated and if those people end up making a hundred million dollars a year because they've made me a million dollars why should they be punished you know and, and all these people are in not all these people and most of the reddit people are young the way i understand it they're young um their parents have money in mutual funds and that's what's going to support their retirement and the loans they're given to the kids who are playing with the money in reddit and they you know, if they push around the mutual funds or something, because it's not just head funds. I mean, there are, there's a lot of public, you know, there's a lot of pension fund money that's got a little bit of money in silver and, you know, and, and, you know, they, uh, they short stocks on occasion or buy puts or calls. So anyway, yeah, but well, I'm taking, I'm taking away from Robert's time. So I okay. show yeah. that, that does make sense. My concern would be if you're in the stock market now is, yeah, it could go to 50,000, 100,000, whether it'll keep up with inflation is another thing. You know, mm -hmm. there's money to be made. 
Matter of fact, I've played in it myself. But uh, what's, what I expect it could be a 20 to 30 percent correction. I can't say for sure. But once the crash does happen and we have a possible bond collapse, because, uh, you know, the, the, a lot of those bonds are nothing, you know, they're not even A-rated or anything. The stock market could go down 60, 70 percent, but nobody can guarantee that. could go down even further. But uh, that's uh, one thing you're playing with fire. If there's money to be made, I can see taking a chance as long as you don't risk your total financial wealth. I mean, yeah. you know, you can you can go play the markets if you want to. Another thing I admit, forgot to mention about modern monetary theory is the way inflation works. And here's what nobody seems to understand. Whenever there's an increase in the quantity of money, the people that benefit are the ones that get the money first because the price of assets haven't ha haven't risen yet, the price of goods and services haven't gone on, so they can buy and purchase at present prices. But as the money moves through the system and prices start rising, the people at the end of the the end of it who get the money last are the ones that the purchasing power is taken away from because they have to pay higher prices. It's even the same thing investing in assets like stocks. All this money's going into stocks. Finally, everybody says, hey, I need to get the stock market. It's been going up, 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 up. But if they're the last ones to get in, they're the ones that are going to get burned at the end. Yeah. Well, I always like to say the end consumer pays all costs. Yeah. And so and you end up with you know, the last guy in, kind of the last guy in, last guy, first guy out, right? You're the one who loses right. all your money. And so, it's yeah. Let me yeah. ask, well, I'm sorry, James, I didn't mean to cut you off. No, go for it, John. Uh, ask a cl clarifying question to make sure I, I just kind of rephrase what you said in my own words. So the first people that are getting this money are, are the big merchant banks and right. the banksters, as Richard and I like to refer to them. I think he used that term and then I heard it from him and I love it. The banksters. They get the money, and they get inflated semi-real money, and then they turn around and if every dollar of uh, semi-real money they get, they lend out ten dollars of funny money. So they're taking funny money and 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 adding a multiplier to it. And the people who get that funny money after it's been multiplied are folks like you and I who use it to buy a car or a home or whatever. Uh, so the, the people, the, the end users, let's call them wage earners. Are, are they people who are actually working for a living at a job somewhere? Or, you know, right now, a lot of them are collecting kind of inflated uh, unemployment benefits. Not in California because the system's broken, but other places where, where you know, the giveaway works. So it's, it's the, the banksters and the merchant bankers and Wall Street to get it first and, and, and use that money to to buy assets before those prices are inflated, pass it through, and the, the consumer, the working man and woman, are the ones that end up paying higher prices for it. Is that is That, a that pretty, is pretty much okay. correct. Of okay. course, depends what you're buying. Not all prices and services go up at the same rate. There yeah. could even be a few that drop because of less demand or increased production, but overall, the average citizen who gets the money last isn't going to pay the price. Mm -hmm. Somebody has to pay the price for inflation. Money isn't wealth. Goods and services are wealth. Money is not wealth. It's just a it's a medium of exchange. That's all it is. It's so how much else. does this modern in my neighborhood gentrification is a big issue where where people who are living in a neighborhood simply can no longer afford to live in that neighborhood. How much have these we'll call them absurdly low interest rates actually fueled that? That cost, that's a inflationary cost that the poor people actually have to pay or can't pay their housing costs because, you know, people who are a little bit higher up on the chain have more access to money. Have act that, you know, has that actually caused the co the price of my neighborhood to get more expensive beyond what it actually should be? Okay. Problem is with the inflationary money, it did not actually go... Even when the corporations got the money, a lot of them bought back their own stock instead of, you know, increasing production or putting it into research and technology. And what happens is that uh, that's that's since that means that the consumers aren't really getting in more good. They would otherwise be getting good, more goods and services and the prices would be lower. So that's already preventing that to happen. The fact that the money is going into the financial sector. And another thing is. 
if it wasn't for all this money be being created, we'd have we'd have lower prices than we have now. I mean, if you look at the price of a new house or a price of an automobile, or even go to the grocery store, I've noticed that myself, prices are going up. Otherwise, if you had a honest economic system backed by gold, and you didn't have the Federal Reserve increasing the quantity of money or the Treasury printing up more money, the consumer would be paying lower prices. So that would be a big, uh, nice, I like that. <laughs> I had to, I'm sorry, I had to grab a silver quarter, an actual silver quarter I got from a, uh, where is it there? I got a silver dollar somewhere. This is this is real money to me. And um, <laughs> I haven't yeah. opened this yet, but uh, here's a roll of real silver dimes. Yeah. There it is. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, it it in in the past um, every time. It, let me let me start again. Every government throughout history that's that's gone to fiat currency, in other words, lessened the value of their currency by increasing the supply, has collapsed. Every single one throughout history. Uh, Romans did it. Um, that's why they actually put uh, edges, they put little edges on, on, on silver coins. These are all worn down. Maybe they were scraped off so that you could tell when somebody sliced a little bit of silver off the edge of the silver coin or the gold coin. And in Roman times, when you find uh, coins from the beginning of the Roman Empire in, uh, in well, from, from when the Romans moved into Britain, mm -hmm. uh, the, the coins are mostly made out of gold and silver. But as the empire started to get a little uh, leaking at the joins, let's say, the, the money became more and more base metal. So uh, correct me if I'm wrong, Robert, but has there ever been a in the history of the world a government that created fiat currency where the economy of that empire or whatever it is didn't collapse under the weight of funny money? Do you know of one? No. And there's okay. not going to be one. So the good old USA is heading the same way. <clears throat> Excuse me. Thing is, though, it's uh, an international problem because nobody's on the gold standard. So all companies are creating fiat monies mm -hmm. like crazy. So there's going to be a general collapse. It just depends. The dollar right now is the international currency, and that's not going to last forever either. No, that's that's why they want they want to stop people from using things like Bitcoin because if there's alternatives, people are bailing on the dollar. And I know over the last three or four months. Uh, my wife's English, so I pay, I pay attention to international currency. The the pound is is not getting pounded anymore. It's they're, they've stopped trying to punish the English for leaving commie Europe. Well, they're still trying, but they're not punishing them as bad. And the, the, I think the pound's about a buck thirty seven, whereas not that long ago it was a buck eighteen. And the, the euro was a buck eight when we went to Paris last year. Was last year, year before last, uh, year before last, and now it's at a buck twenty. So uh, the the dollars already get taken a beating, um, in in international. And I I read something that's kind of frightening. The official uh, number for GDP to or debt to GDP worldwide was about seventy eight percent. Seventy eight percent of of uh, Governments typically had worldwide 78% of the gross national product or GNP or GDP, gross domestic product, uh, in debt. And after the latest round of collapsed economy propped up by funny money, it's, it's, a, it's like 95%. And that doesn't count all of the unfunded public employee pensions uh, that are out there. I mean, California is probably a trillion dollars in debt with what it owes teachers and firemen and overpaid public employees. So, you know, it's uh, the, the rate of collapse or the rate of leakage in the economic system is accelerating. At least that's what I'm seeing. You're seeing the same thing, Robert? Yes. Uh, I think in the United States, uh, that ratio has hit about 130, 135%. So 
they've no no notice once it goes above 90 percent each dollar produces less than what is printed if you add an extra dollar and they only produce 65 cents where the goods and services add to gdp so they're in a losing situation now modern monetary theorists point to japan and say well they got something like 235 percent but where's their economy gone in the last 30 years and uh, their currency is in the international monetary currency that's considered the currency so it's not going to work so this modern monetary theory they think they can drive it to 200 percent 250 percent 300 percent and it won't matter hmm. yeah I, i'm kind of agreeing with you robert it's already mattering um you know if uh you know i mean people would see it uh in the cost of food but you know, where you normally get people rioting and looting is that when the, the poorest people start not being able to buy bread, then, uh, or, you know, have to do without something that they want, then they realize that there's something going on and they start getting itchy trigger fingers and, you know, parading through the streets. But with the aid, uh, they don't call it aid to families with uh, dependent children anymore, they call it something else that program now includes something like 30 percent of the population in this country so the, the poor people don't even don't see the effect that you or i see when we go to a grocery store they uh because they just hand over that little credit card or debit card and mm -hmm. they get food it's so, called the star card here i believe in texas yeah. no you're in texas okay yeah yeah yeah, yeah well we can actually see the long-term effects of that monetary policy on our streets. We are watching the homeless, you know, rise in California because you can no longer afford to buy a house. In my neighborhoods, they closed down a bunch of low-income motels because of blight, and now we have a bunch of people living on the sidewalk instead. So, oh, it, yeah. you know, helping the blight didn't seem to do much to help the blight. Hmm. So, Robert, we got less than a minute. Is there anything you wanted to kind of close up with? Yeah, this is something we probably could do on another show, but it's what we're going to get eventually is universal basic income. And that's going to have a lot of bad effects. People think they're, they get their $2,000 check a month. Oh, this is great. But they don't realize that the uh, consequences of that and the price they're going to pay, they're going to pay with their liberty and freedom for that universal basic income. But that, I believe, is part of modern monetary theory. And I believe that is on its way, especially when uh, you see what happens, we may have a quick recovery, you know, to do the so-called vaccine, which is another <laughs> episode you can have on if you're allowed to talk about it, that is. <laughs> but uh, it, I, I see there's a possible short-term recovery coming maybe in the spring or something. But I think after that, uh, we got some real problems and that's when they'll be introducing universal basic income. Well, Robert, we'll have to get you back on to have a, a longer conversation. For more information about Robert, you can go to ramoneyjourney.com and read what he's got. He's got a lot of interesting articles on there to read. This is Gail Morgan thanking you for watching the Libertarian Counterpoint each Thursday at 8 p.m. Channel 17 on Comcast, on YouTube, and on Facebook. We invite you to come again next week for the Libertarian Counterpoint.